we are switching to the speaker view. I see a number of attendees joining us, which is very nice. Okay, and now we are in speaker view, and I think I can start with our workshop. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, or whatever time it may be on the world where you are in this moment. I'm very happy to welcome you to our workshop on fighting falsified and substandard medicines during the COVID-19 crisis. Our workshop is hosted by the Association of Research-Based Pharmaceutical Companies, in German language, the Verband der Forschenden Arzneimittelhersteller, so the abbreviation VFA, as well as by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. My name is Lutz Heide, and I'm a professor at the Pharmaceutical Institute of Tübingen University in Germany, and I will be the chairman of today's workshop. And I'm very glad that we have a panel of very distinguished speakers with us, whom I will introduce in turn when they give their presentations. Um, we have a focus today on the African continent. Ladies and gentlemen, substandard and falsified medicines are a problem anywhere in this world, but they most heavily affect low and middle income countries. World Health Organization has estimated that just for two diseases, childhood pneumonia and malaria, the number of deaths resulting from poor quality medicines amounts to 100,000 to 300,000 every year. This is just two diseases. If we take in all the diseases, we are talking about many hundred thousands, maybe millions of deaths. Therefore, subsidized and falsified medicines may rival the deadly effect of HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis. And we have to ask ourselves, are we addressing enough efforts to this problem? And the problem has increased in the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted production and supply chains worldwide, the diminishing access to medicine. And now personal protective equipment, medicines, and in due course, vaccines for COVID-19 become in, will become in high demand, far outstripping supply. And this is exactly the condition where criminal counterfeiters come in and bring in their products. So our workshop today will discuss a question, how did the corona crisis influence the prevalence of falsified medicines? How did the different stakeholders react? Which strategies were applied? And which key actions should be taken now in the crisis, but also beyond this crisis? We will have our speakers introducing this topic from the view of government regulatory authorities civil society, non-governmental organizations, academia, industry, but also our remote participants can actually join our discussion. If you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you see the Q&A, the question and answer field, and you're welcome to type in questions, which I and actually my colleague Eva Gürken will um, forward to the different speakers. Feel free to type in questions. If you want them to be addressed to a specific speaker, write to which speakers you want them, want them to be addressed. If you, as a remote participant, want to briefly give your name and your affiliation, um, that is welcome. Okay, um, we will have question and answers immediately after each um, presentation if they are just short questions for clarification and at towards the end of our session we'll have a larger discussion session with the question of answers by the participants but also from the panel the organizers have kindly allowed us to extend our session a little bit exactly until 12 45 because we have one additional speaker whom i will 
introduce in uh, due course. Um, and I will actually also invite all our panelists for a final statement before we close. So without further ado, I would now like to introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Moji Christiana Adeyeye. And she is actually Director General of the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control in Nigeria. So of the National Drug Regulatory Organization in Nigeria. Um, all of you know, Nigeria is a country with the largest population on the African continent. So arguably, Professor Moji is head of the most important uh, medicine regulatory agency on the African continent. Before she assumed this big responsibility, she had a long-standing academic career in the United States. She was professor of pharmacy in two, uni two universities in the United States. After assuming leadership of NAFTAC, she has really done a tremendous job of shaping this agency into a very effective and leading agency on the African continent. Early this year in February, I had the privilege to join the American Medicine Quality Forum in Abuja in Nigeria, which actually was headed by you, Professor uh, Moji, and I was very impressed by your initiative to spearhead the initiative for improvement of medicine quality on the African continent. You are the ideal person to open our workshop with your lecture on Nigeria's strategy to counter an increase in the prevalence of fortified medicines. Mod Professor Modi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Heidi. Uh, the topic of my speech this morning is Nigeria's strategy to counter an increase in the prevalence of falsified medicines. What is the reality in Nigeria? The COVID-19 pandemic has completely destroyed or disrupted, I shouldn't say destroyed, disrupted the medicine supply chain and brought huge challenges in ensuring medicine safety in Nigeria. Nigeria is unfortunately an import dependent country for active pharmaceutical ingredients and finished products. What were the consequences? Because of COVID, the prices of drugs went up rapidly as a result of the lockdown, as well as the restrictions in terms of cyberspace. Our manufacturers could not get finished products or APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients. This led to drug scarcity and increased falsification of COVID-19 commodities such as chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and sanitizers. NAVDAC has been using creative means to combat falsification of medicines prior to COVID-19, but more enhanced during the pandemic. NAVDAC has adopted or has always adopted three strategies almost uh, four or five years ago uh, to counter the prevalence of falsified medicines in Nigeria under the WHO frameworks of prevention, detection, and response. You can see how the bad merchants that sell falsified medicines can be so smart. Look at these two, two capsules. One is falsified, one is not. It is difficult to identify which one. That is, the, that is how much work we have to do as regulators. In terms of prevention, NAVDAC has done the following. Of course, increased surveillance on COVID-19 related products. We did a lot of work on sanitizers, especially people using less than 60% alcohol or even using methanol. We have increased public alert notices to consumers 
retailers, distributors, importers of face masks, test kits, and other items used uh, or being used during this pandemic. We have increased the capacity of the laboratory to carry out standardization tests on face masks, test kits, aside from the therapeutics and other COVID-19 related products. NAVDAC has developed regulations to address gaps identified around NAVDAC activities during this pandemic. It is a, a two-edged sword. The pandemic brought a lot of uh, disruption, but at the same time, it helped us to address what ordinarily we will not address or we will not address that much uh, in, in the case of emergency. Therefore, based on our quality management system, we have developed business continuity plan across the entire agency. And this is for internal convergence of NAVDAC activities. Talking, continuing with prevention, we have strengthened good manufacturing practices, inspection of pharmaceutical companies to ensure compliance. We had 165 companies inspected over six months in Nigeria, and that resulted in categorization of the companies to low risk, medium risk, and high risk. And the goal is to guide them towards compliance. We have set up policies, we call it five plus five validity to encourage local manufacturing companies or to, to encourage local manufacturing, I'm sorry. The five plus five validity is that, is, it means that if you are a, an importer, you have been given five years renewal at the end of your five years, you have to tell us how you're going to migrate into local manufacturing or partnering with local manufacturers. NABDAC has also had government funded in intervention, or excuse me, the country has had government funded intervention for infrastructure rebuilding of qualified pharmaceutical companies. And I had to be the go between uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria and the pharmaceutical companies to ensure that the government will put money where the money can really work in terms of building or rebuilding infrastructure of some companies. NAVDAC has enforced pre-shipment clean report inspection analysis. We've had this for years. However, there were loopholes, there were compromises in this particular uh, activity. So what we did was to go to India and China last year and read them the riot act that we're going to be very strict with products that are coming in because about 70 percent of our pharmaceutical products come from that part of the world we read them the riot act and we mentioned we told our uh, analysts over there that you've got to do the job we actually went over uh, the two countries about 17 laboratories we already, we got the criteria that we needed. We inspected the laboratories. So it means that we are working much closer uh, to our clean report inspection analysts in the two countries. And this has led to enhanced reporting of substandard falsified medicines by the CRRA agents and the laboratories. We are classifying companies now at, as high risk if we find them to be falsifying their products. We have just blacklisted a company and delisted the Nigerian uh, market authorization holder. We are planning to use supply chain mapping model to predict substandard falsified medicines infiltration into the chain as post marketing surveillance. Detection. We conduct risk based post marketing surveillance. We have increased the capacity building of our laboratory analysts, analysts and upgraded, or we are upgrading our laboratories almost every day for efficient detection of falsified medical products, whether it's face masks, therapeutics, test kits, COVID-19 related products. We are now in the process of procuring detection devices. Nigeria was the first uh, country in the world to use true scan. That was about uh, seven, about 12 years ago, or seven to 12 years, uh, 10 years ago, 10 years ago. 
but we are now procuring more. Why? Because Nigeria has very weak porous borders. And why? Because for seven years before I assumed my position as NAVDAC Director General, NAVDAC was removed from the ports for seven years, 2011 to 2018. Cabals were built and everybody started bringing anything they want into the country. That is why we are stepping up in a big way. So we are procuring through scan as we speak. And then we're establishing traceability techniques to build sanity or to bring sanity into our distribution supply chain. We also plan to collaborate on forensic investigations using novel techniques such as genomics, table isolates, and equipment um, or mass, spectrum, mass spectrometry. Response, sometimes, you know, response and uh, prevention may go hand in hand. We are applying regulatory sanctions, which is more effective than prosecution in our country. Sanctions are more effective because the judicial system is slower in terms of putting the bad people behind bars. We are, I've mentioned it, we are blacklisting manufacturers because we want to protect, we want to safeguard the health of our people. We'll continue to strengthen the regulatory framework using our quality management systems, which is a continuous uh, process uh, after receiving our ISO 9001 certification last year. Information sharing, very, very important among regulatory agencies and we will continue to do that. We will continue to improve on that. We are going through WHO global benchmarking assessments as we speak to improve NAVDAC activities. And this tie in very, very closely with ensuring that we mitigate or reduce significantly substandard falsified medicines. Thank you so much. It is good to be here. Thank you very much, Professor Modi. That was very enlightening. Um, I think it was very interesting that you could really show the perspective of a drug regulatory agency, all the angles which you have to address. Um, I'm especially glad that you also mentioned the problem of um, actually checking the suppliers and the importance of supplier qualification that we can make sure that the sources where we buy the medicines from are as good as possible. And as well, you mentioned the rapid detection devices. You mentioned the TrueScan, which is one of the brands of handheld Raman spectrometers, which allow a quick investigation of medicines um, just within seconds. And we may come back to these technologies later in our discussion. Thank you very much. And without further ado, I would like to in, um, now introduce our next speaker who is Dr. Richard Nezi. Of He is the executive director of the Ecumenical Pharmaceutical Network in Kenya. Um, that's a network of church-related agencies, which especially provide medicines for church-related health facilities. Um, he has assumed this very important post earlier this year, before Richard was the director of in the Democratic Republic of Congo of the Depot Central Medico Pharmaceutique in Bukavo. Uh, Richard, I had the privilege to visit you there a few years ago. And actually, I learned that you already, yes, you also collaborate with Dr. Dennis Mukwege, who may be known to a, quite a number of our um, listeners um, as the Nobel Peace Prize winner of 2018. We also had um, some good experience together in working together in studies. And therefore, I would like to ask Professor Moji Adeyeye to actually close her screen sharing mode in this moment. Thank you. And then like to ask Richard to put on his slides um, and the floor is yours now, Richard. Thank you, Professor Lutz. I'm really uh, happy to be part of this panel. And I would like to talk about the work of the Ecumenical Pharmaceutical Network 
and all the activities we are doing to fight against falsified and substandard medicines in Africa. At the end, I will share the lessons learned and the recommendations for future action. As you were saying, the uh, EPN network comprises uh, 119 members in 37 countries. Most of them are in Africa. And the network is constituted by Church of Association, Church of Institutions, Drug Supply Organization. We have 18 drug supply organizations and 37 individual members, but also we have uh, other non-governmental organizations related to church and also international. And we are committed to the provision of quality pharmaceutical services by supporting churches and church health system provide just and compassionate pharmaceutical services. As you may know, the uh, church health system is serving more than 30, uh, 300 million of people around the world. This is our network, but I know the church health system in Sub-Saharan Africa is serving more and more people, especially in rural area. And we cut uh, around, uh, for around 40% of uh, the health of people living in, uh, in, in rural areas, but also uh, our, the church health systems tend to the medical needs of thousands of people, especially centered and often the only health facility for mice. Uh, the church health system is also facing too many challenges. One of them is the overlooked by governments when they it comes to the allocation of financial and commodities, medical commodities during national budgeting. But also the facilities tend to operate with inadequate generated revenue and all these contexts in, uh, on which we can add the limited number of qualified, especially pharmaceutical uh, staff and you know, as most of our health facilities are located in rural areas, we are also facing the challenge to retain uh, those who are qualified uh, to serve in this area. As you can see, we actually, there was one study done in our church of system, which showed that uh, most of people who are uh, working in the pharmacy uh, department of our church of institutions mostly are uh, from other background. 40% was from other background and uh, only 10% of pharmacists. This is a very big challenge to manage medicine without the, uh, the very uh, qualified uh, staff. Mm -hmm. Our mini lab network which is one of our strategy to promote the quality of medicines within church of institutions. Uh, we use the mini lab, which is, was developed by the Global Pharma Health Fund. This is a Merck Foundation. And our strategy is to make it available uh, to all our member in order to screen the quality of medicine entering in the church health system. The mini lab started in 2010 by general support of DFAM, the medical, German Institute for Medical Mission, which is also a member institution and one of the leader of EPN. And this was really to support the church health system, especially uh, our drug supply organization to be able to check and to test the quality of medicine before we can introduce them in the church health system. And also within the mini lab network where we are trying to share uh, knowledge and to facilitate information sharing among our members uh, in the network across African continent and in India. 
But also uh, one interesting thing is that the work of the mini lab has led to increased quality awareness, not only within the faith based health sector, but also in the, in the country, in different countries in which our mini lab network is collaborating with local authorities, but also with international partners. This is the picture of our uh, mini lab network. Actually, we have 16 partners in 13 countries. And from the beginning, we have been able to, uh, to test more than 4,000 of samples. What have been uh, uh, seen in this pandemic period, we was really conscious that the emergency context is always an opportunity for pharmaceutical criminals to introduce substandard drugs in the health system. That's why we decide to uh, shift our priority as a network and to start monitoring the quality of medicines which are reported to may be effective against the COVID. EPN members was all called to uh, share information and issues of quality of medicine, especially the chloroquine and other uh, medicines and, and uh, products used in the time of the pandemic. And in collaboration with DFAM and the University of Tübingen, I'm happy to be with Prof Lutz, who is always supporting the mini lab network to really conduct uh, a, a full screening and testing of medicine and also to support our work as mini lab until we make publication and the support uh, to, to, to raise the awareness globally. And this uh, is the picture of the recent results of uh, the mini lab work which led to the WHO medical product alert number four of 2020. And you can, as you may see the five pictures we have, the, all the products were found in the church health system by our member of mini lab. Some was uh, found directly in uh, our hospitals when it was from up April, when this pandemic and the need of chloroquine was raised because the product was said to be effective uh, to treat the, uh, uh, the pandemic. And the first product and the, the fifth one, which you can see it's the same laboratory and the same name of the product, but uh, the first one we found, it, it, it said that it has one, 100 milligram of, of chloroquine, but when we conduct the test, the first was the uh, mini lab test, and then the confirmatory test was done at, uh, the, in the laboratory at Tübingen University, and we found only 21 milligram of the quinine. And the fifth one, which is said to have chloroquine, you, it, it was uh, found that inside we had a, one milligram of paracetamol and 14 milligram of metronidazole. So what you can see, the product is said to have been manufactured by the same company in China, but the same bulk, uh, bulk box, but Finally, even the label is different. The same product, but different. That's why in the mini lab, the visual inspection is one aspect in which even we try to train the uh, clinicians and all the, uh, the health workers so that they can be able, even in having the product and looking to the product, they can uh, detect the suspicious indices which can help to say, yeah, this product needs further investigations. And uh, the product number two and number four basically seems to be the same laboratory, 
you can see how the color of the two products are different. And also uh, the first one was said to contain 100 milligram of, of, of chloroquine, but we found paracetamol inside, 35 milligram of paracetamol. And the same uh, uh, label, but number four, we found inside metronidazole, 14 milligram. Even the metronidazole, the paracetamol, uh, the strength was not enough uh, to be able to give results. And this chloroquine, which was said to be manufactured by a company in Kenya, we found inside metronidazole. So you can really understand how this pandemic uh, became really a challenge for the quality of medicine in uh, the Sub-Saharan Africa. You can find further uh, details on this uh, publication in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. This is the alert which was uh, published by the WHO. To finish, I would really uh, talk about four main challenges and how we should move forward. First, I think we need to expand the mini lab in Africa because the mini lab is really a very useful tool which can save lives. More funding is needed to increase the number of mini labs in place, but also to all the members who are using the mini lab, most of them, uh, uh, they don't have full-time staff dedicated to the mini lab because uh, this need uh, is now found to have uh, people dedicated to this work. So they use the same staff in other uh, tasks in the, the different organizations. But also, you know, we need to buy those samples. The, this uh, chloroquine, in, when the need was raised in the market, it, one uh, box of 1,000 1, tablets was around $250 US dollars. So we need sometimes funds to uh, buy samples because- uh, Richard, you have another 30 seconds to conclude. Mm -hmm. So the, the next point is the, that we need to reinforce and, uh, and to sustain the church of supply chain because most of the product were found at this level of the church. And also we need, uh, to make the, the, the church of institutions be part of the national supply system. But also we need a, a very strong collaboration between the church of network uh, and the mini lab, especially with the government, because uh, when this, uh, where the, the collaboration was strong, we was able really to have good result and also uh, to come even to regulation sanctions and sometimes prosecutions, which is need to improve and to make the uh, medicine, good quality medicine to be available in the system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for this very enlightening lecture. Um, thanks for showing a real example of a falsification of a medicine in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. And I'm very happy that this was actually discovered by the members of your network using um, one of the rapid screening tools, in this case, the Minilab. Um, and I think Karim Bendao later on will also talk, uh, talk a little bit about this important tool, which is probably the most widely one, um, widely used one in this moment. So thank you very much. I would like to go on directly to our next speaker, who is Professor Claver Kayumba, joining us from Rwanda. Um, he is a mem faculty member of the Department of Pharmacy of the University of Rwanda. Um, he is also a leading member of the East African Community Regional Center of Excellence for Vaccines, Immunization, and health supply chain management, and obviously an institution which is of vital importance for us now. And 
recently he has also assumed the position as a chair of the board of directors for Rwanda Medical Supply Limited, a company which has been founded by Rwandan government to ensure access to safe, efficacious, quality assured and affordable medicines for the Rwandan population. Um, we have met several times in Rwanda, in Germany. We even co-supervise a PhD student. Um, so I'm very happy that you're with us and we look forward to your talk on fighting falsified and substantive medicines during the COVID-19 crisis case of Rwanda. And you are joined by your colleague Vedasta Hapyalimana, who, as I understand, is in charge of quality assurance, quality control in Rwanda Medical Supply Limited. Clavier and Vedasta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the opportunity given to us to speak to this uh, a big uh, assembly, which is the World Health Summit. It's a pleasure really to uh, talk about uh, fighting of this pandemic of uh, falsified and substandard medicine. Uh, as you have uh, said, Professor Roots, uh, I found very key to be with uh, somebody who is uh, managing uh, who is fighting in the front line at uh, this pandemic, we, who is uh, Vedas Habyarimana. Uh, so it's very uh, innovative to combine these efforts between academicians and uh, supply chain managers uh, to fight the pandemic. I will, uh, this is uh, the outline of our presentation. Uh, without further ado, uh, we go uh, through the presentation. I would like to introduce the uh, Rwanda Medical Supply Limited. You know, um, in uh, Rwanda, for public health entities, uh, the supply chain was uh, uh, assured by um, an institution affiliated to the Ministry of Health. And uh, supply chain in Rwanda follows the procurement law of the country. So we are having a single law governing all type of procurement in the country. So you will all understand that uh, health commodities cannot follow the same law or to, pro to procure uh, chairs or computers I'm using now. So, um, uh, at a given time then, um, we had a kind of consistent uh, stockouts due to the uh, procurement process, which uh, uh, by requirement of the law should pass by uh, open tendering process for transparency purpose. It's good to have such kind of transparency, but the open tendering system is always taking longer like uh, for example, from um, advertisement to the contract sign signature, maybe it might take four to, to five months, delivery uh, like uh, three months. So meaning the whole process might take like um, between six and nine and, and nine months. So within that period, then we face uh, stockouts and therefore it's, it could be an opportunity for counterfeiters uh, to uh, put in uh, falsified medicines in the country. So uh, the government of Rwanda then has decided to create this uh, Rwanda Medical Supply Limited as a company. So that, uh, I, as I will elaborate a bit later, so that we shorten, we set up a procedures manual that will help us to shorten uh, that uh, uh, procurement uh, uh, lead time. So it we, it's serving then as a national medical procurement and distribution agency. It covers 85% for supply of essential medicines in the country to the public facilities. Of course, for programs, it supplies 100% to the public facilities, the same for medical equipment. 
Uh, we have uh, put there our modest uh, budget a year, and then um, I will um, hand over to Vedas just to talk about uh, how the uh, crisis linked to COVID has been uh, managed at uh, Rwanda Medical Supply and uh, in the country in general. Over to you, uh, Vedas. If I may just come in, uh, please watch the time. You have already used up most of the time allotted, so please try to be concise in the presentation. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, concerning the crisis of COVID-19 in Rwanda, first of all, there was uh, a national crisis committee created and chaired by the prime minister. Then the committee put in place a COVID, a national COVID joint task force just to coordinate uh, the implementation of preparedness and response plan. Uh, actually, as uh, Professor Kayumba said, the procurement process, the normal one, took between uh, six and nine months to have the medicines in the country. But during COVID, there was a really need to, 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 to be very quick and uh, use the emergency system and have the medicines. And during that period, we had the procured uh, medicines and other related products, but also the in-kind donations in several types of products. As the challenges we met, there was disruption of normal supply chain, leading to imbalance between the supply and the demand. And also we had the, to face the problem of higher costs and shortages of products. For example, we had a very big problem of gloves in that period, and uh, we had some uh, suppliers who terminated the contract because they were also having other demands from other countries. There is an example of one who terminated after just delivering 28%. We had also the problem of export restrictions. For example, the cementidine product during the COVID uh, uh, period we didn't have any supply because the supplier refused to give it as in the country in India, there was a restriction to export that cement deal. We also had the problem of transport disruptions and the delivery delays. We had the case of medical equipment, uh, which were de de delayed for around two months. And also, the reception of a product with the miscellaneous in kind of, sorry, with the foreign languages, as I'm going to show you in the, in the next slide. This is an example of Halotan inhalation anesthetic. We received this product and using our uh, visual inspection, as we have a tool we use every time at receiving, this product was uh, suspicious by seeing it. Actually, as you can see on picture, uh, it has several similarities. But when you can, okay, on the pack, outer packaging, packaging box and even on the bottles, uh, one, the left one has a, a, some writings in, a, in Indian language and also informations differ. So oh, you can see even the closures, how they are. One is R and W, another one has nothing. So we were asking ourselves which one is true, which one is uh, falsified. So we conducted some um, investigations and at the end, we realized that this one of the boxes were genuine, another one was uh, a copy. Actually, on uh, the, the left one is the, the genuine one, the right one is the, uh, the, the copy. Because there was, uh, we, we went on the market and realized that the left one is the real one with, on which it is uh, written, uh, man, manufactured by, they gave a name, and marketed by another one. So the marketing authorizing holder copied and uh, put on the market. Also, when we tried to contact the, the the manufacturer, we were always responded by another address. He has never responded because he was already guilty. This is the case. 
another I'd like to briefly come in and just say, Veras, thank you for showing us a real life example. I can only give you one more minute, so you may have to skip a few slides, please. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. This is another example with the just uh, uh, typo errors in labeling. Another example is a category of product with foreign languages, no French, no English, while there are official languages used in Rwanda. This is another type of medicine where we found particulate matter into the, the injectable product. We had the Kiosin product and the Fitomenadion with particulate matters. So as the mitigation strategies, I will pass the word to Professor. Thank you very much. Um, the World Health Organization and um, our uh, agency uh, should um, yeah, develop these uh, special procurement guidelines and uh, in kind donation of strict requirements. In our country, normally if a, a product is not uh, usable in um, uh, the source can, uh, country, it can't be given as um, uh, a donation. And then there are those uh, core principles uh, 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 related to my, uh, supp uh, supplying. We are envisaging now since, since we are a company to direct purchase from manufacturers or representatives, avoiding to pass through uh, second and third suppliers. And we have, uh, we had an option of, um, of uh, um, uh, supply. Claudia, I must ask you to come to the end of your presentation. Absolutely. Uh, such a strategy have uh, uh, paid off uh, since now in our settings, COVID-19 uh, uh, is uh, being carved down. Uh, more people are uh, uh, recovering uh, than uh, infected. And um, the situation currently uh, is always mentioned on our television. And thank you very much uh, uh, for your kind attention. He will be pleased to answer one another a question during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, both Claver and Vedaste, for giving us first-hand experience of how really the supply chains are disrupted during the COVID-19 pandemic and how this directly translates into identification of falsified medicines. Thanks very much. Um, I would like to move over to our next speaker, um, and who is Dr. Karim Bendao, and he is head of the Africa Bureau of the Merck Pharmaceutical Company, so of a German pharmaceutical company. He has been with pharmaceutical industry for more than two decades. And I think he nearly has um, connected with every African country during his work. So he has ample experience. Um, and actually just a year ago, he was appointed as the chairman of the Africa Engagement Committee of the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations. So Karim, I think you are the ideal person to talk to us about fake medication, the role of the private sector. Please. Thank you very much, Professor Eli. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yes, today I will uh, 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 speak on behalf of the International Federation about the role of the private sector uh, uh, in this uh, uh, dramatic, uh, you know, uh, things which is the uh, falsified uh, medicine. Karim, in this moment, I cannot hear you. There may be a connection problem. Personally, and I'm uh, uh, concerned by, do we have a connection problem? N now you're back. I think we are fine again. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. This is a, a French connection. Huh? That's the best that <laughs> we can get in France. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to come back to this, uh, I mean, uh, to fight falsified medicines, we need definitely to work all hand in hand. I mean, tackling this uh, issue, we need uh, to uh, 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 strengthen the legislative frameworks, to uh, uh, regular, to improve regulatory system, 
and also to collect properly the data uh, uh, related to what is happening on the field. Implementation of a uh, new and effective technology is also key and uh, uh, raising the awareness. No awareness, I mean, uh, people will not understand what is really happening with the drugs. So, the first of all, MediCrime. I think this is a unique international tool uh, uh, criminalizing uh, the trade of counterfeited products. Uh, Medic Medicrime uh, have been launched, I think, in 2016, and very warm welcomed by all the uh, private associations. Uh, the international one, IFPMA, the European one, Pharma the American, the Generic Pharmaceutical Association. So uh, we need to put at the level of criminal offense in all the countries the falsification of medicines, whatever it is. Uh, uh, the definition, because we have there some uh, discussion and debate, the, uh, uh, the definition of counterfeited medicines. Le, we need also to have a, a specific uh, legislative framework for falsified uh, medicine and, fals and, and, and falsification of, uh, of, of medicines. Regulatory framework, we are really all of us uh, uh, in the frame of uh, public-private partnership, uh, try to cooperate with the uh, uh, governments, with the uh, uh, regulatory agency all over the world, uh, to strengthen and, and to share also uh, our experience and our expert in, uh, in, 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 in regulatory, uh, in improving regulatory uh, uh, framework. You know, I think it's time now, uh, in the light of this COVID-19, to understand that the health system uh, can, or the issues related to the health system, uh, can be resolved only with a strong and solid and transparent, and I insist on that, transparent uh, uh, partnership. Hand in hand, we have to work. We have to improve the environment and the ecosystem in order to protect our population and the worldwide uh, population. And this uh, 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 way to work together in a transparent way, I think this is this will be, ex you will see extremely uh, uh, accelerated during the COVID-19 and um, its resolution. Data collection, we have the Pharmaceutical Security Institute. So we are, uh, uh, it's, uh, we are collecting data from and gathering data and consolidating data uh, in this in this institute uh, through uh, uh, through the members and from the members, but uh, uh, we need also uh, to raise a bit of resources and to see more invol involvement in this. But this is really part also of the strategy of the uh, uh, private sectors. Last but not least. The technologies, the technology is the only way. I mean, uh, uh, you, you've seen in the previous presentation how it's difficult to identify a falsified product once it's on the market. Uh, and it's uh, also difficult uh, uh, to uh, arrest people and uh, uh, to put them behind the bars uh, if you don't prove that it's also a falsified product. So we have two ways to do it. Uh, and controlling remotely on the field. And this is what uh, Richard is doing a lot with his organization and the Minilab. And uh, 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 we have also to improve uh, all, the, all our uh, packaging and we have to use uh, also uh, data matrix, we have to use uh, blockchains. So we cannot here go through all the technologies that are ra raising currently, but believe me, there is a huge work done currently and, and, and tremendous creativity uh, coming from the uh, med tech uh, to allow us to better control uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, falsified product and the breach of the, the chain of distribution. Uh, the Vinilab is one, uh, 
I love this tool because I think it's involved at the early stage. But just in order to know, we have currently more than uh, 800 mini labs uh, uh, running in, in, in more than 100 countries. And as you uh, may notice on this, uh, on this uh, slide, that Africa is the biggest uh, uh, beneficiary of this, uh, this, uh, this uh, mini lab. Uh, I think this tool is just to understand the concept. I mean, uh, uh, when you are, uh, I don't know, in the marketplace in front of two products, how can you identify and assess if the, the, the product is uh, uh, fake or falsified or, uh, uh, or not? I mean, the only way is to test it on site. Otherwise, uh, you will never find again, uh, uh, you know, the guy who was distributing. Uh, 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 and selling this uh, this uh, falsified product, uh, our uh, uh, colleagues uh, previously have have said even the company they have not been able to find the company, you know. So if you cannot find the company, believe me, you cannot find the distributor. Uh, two days later, the day you will uh, discover that the product uh, sent to the central lab uh, was falsified. So it is something that we still can improve the mini lab but uh, my recommendation is to use it as much as we can uh, to fight uh, and the last but not least you know the awareness so we have Karim, this uh, please watch yeah. for the time mm -hmm. yeah that's uh, my conclusion <laughs> 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 that's my conclusion because this is a fifth uh, pillar of the, okay. the, the strategy and fight the facts is about it's the association taking care about the awareness and the education. So we are all involved there. And I'm also inviting people and organization uh, uh, to work. Final statement. There are currently no approved treatment, vaccine or cures for COVID-19. So this message should be spread as much as we can until we discover something. Thank you very much for your time. And... Uh, I leave the stage now. <laughs> Thank you, Karim. Um, especially also thanks for bringing in the point of legislation, which I think is also a very important point. And I think you and love share, you and I sh love share the love for the mini lab, which I think is really a great tool. And my compliments to the Merck company and actually to the Association of Research Based Companies for supporting that. I think that is one instrument which enables people in Africa actually to take analysis also in their own, into their own hands. Thanks a lot. Um, and I would like to go to our next speaker, who is Professor Sachiko Ozawa. Um, she is at the Eshelman School of Pharmacy in the University of North Carolina. And I may say that this is one of the most highly respected schools of pharmacy in the entire world. Um, Sachi is an health economist. Um, she has written one of the most important review articles about the prevalence of substance and falsified medicines and their um, economic impact. And that is one um, subject where she is especially well known for developing models to estimate the economic impact of substance and falsified medicines and this is also the topic of her presentation. Sachiko, I'm very pleased that you are with us and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Professor Heidi. Can, you hear, can everyone hear me? Wonderful. So today I'd like to talk to you about the economic impact of substandard and falsified medicines. Uh, my name is Hachi Ozawa and I'm an associate professor at UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So we conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis to understand the prevalence of substandard and falsified medicines in low middle income countries. And we found that medicine quality is a global problem. Um, so what do we mean by substandard and falsified medicines? Uh, we utilize the definition agreed upon by 194 member states of the World Health Organization, where substandard medicines are authorized medical products that fail to meet either their quality standards or specifications or both and falsified medical products are those that are deliberately or fraudulently misrepresenting their identity, composition, or source. 
And across studies in low and middle income countries, we found that one in 10 assessed low and assessed essential medicines are of poor quality. Overall prevalence of substandard and falsified medicines in low and middle income countries was 13.6%, including 19.1% for antimalarials and 12.4% for antibiotics. Regional prevalence of substandard and falsified medicines was highest in Africa at 18.7% and in Asia at 13.7%. We then looked at factors that may be associated with countries having poor medicine quality. And we conducted an analysis across 51 low and middle income countries using data from our systematic review, the World Health Organization's Global Observatory data, and the World Bank's uh, World Governments ind Indicators. And we found that countries with more substandard and falsified medicines tend to have poor government effectiveness and lower health insurance coverage of essential services. This could mean that countries with stronger capacity to provide a greater health insurance coverage could be in a better position to effectively regulate the medicine supply chain, thus preventing the availability of poor quality medicines. This could also mean that countries with higher coverage of essential services and quality medicines can mitigate the need for people to seek potentially compromised medicines from informal markets. We then developed the systems map that links medicine quality with universal health coverage. So let's quickly walk through it together. I know there's a lot going on in the slide. Um, first look at the blue ovals. Um, this map, the essential steps involved for beneficiaries to receive quality assured medicines. It illustrates the movement of medicines from manufacturing, procurement, and through the supply chain to reach health facilities after which beneficiaries who seek healthcare can obtain and utilize the medicines. We then map the resulting benefits in pink rectangles. Um, when beneficiaries utilize quality assured medicines as opposed to no medicines or poor quality medicines, beneficiaries can be healthier with a shorter duration of illness and milder symptoms, thus needing less additional healthcare and having the possibility to return to work earlier. Quality assured medicines bring further benefits illustrated in orange rectangles. Um, appropriate use of quality assured medicines contributes to maintaining medicine efficacy by delaying the development of antimicrobial resistance. When beneficiaries require less healthcare because they have access and utilize quality assured medicines, they decrease the risk of becoming poor due to additional expenses for medicines and healthcare. And healthier beneficiaries are also more productive in society, resulting in productivity gains. So ensuring medicine quality thus contributes to the overall goal of universal health coverage to ensure healthcare access without suffering financial hardship when paying for them. So let's now look at the purple and green rectangles. When beneficiaries require less healthcare, the health system is less burdened and the, health, the quality of health services could improve. As beneficiaries require less care, healthcare costs for health insurers decrease, and those savings could be reinvested back into the system. Those savings can cover more medicines and services, they can cover more beneficiaries, or cover more costs incurred by individuals to reduce patients' cost sharing for medicines and health services. And finally, we have the yellow rectangles that are the regulatory oversight and quality assurance mechanisms throughout the supply chain. And these interventions include best practices, policies, regulations, and education that reinforces the system that ensures patients can obtain and use quality assured medicines. So we demonstrate here that ensuring medicine quality through quality assurance and strong regu regulatory functions can enable countries to scale the implementation of universal health coverage. So at this point, you may ask, uh, what is the global economic impact of substandard and falsified medicines? Based on our systematic review, we found approximations of the economic impact that range from 10 billion to 200 billion. Now this is a wide range, uh, focused primarily on market size with poor or undisclosed methods in estimation. So we then tried to estimate in more detail the health economic impact of poor quality antimalarials at the country level. 
and we developed the substandard and falsified antimalarial research impact model, known as the SAFARI model. And this agent-based model simulated malaria disease progression, care-seeking, treatment outcomes, and incurred costs. And we found that improving the quality of antimalarials by removing one in 10 poor quality ones results in hundreds and thousands of fewer deaths annually in these countries. For example, ensuring that 10% more antimalarials are quality assured can result in 22 fewer deaths per day in Nigeria and three fewer deaths per week in Zambia. And moreover, we estimated that investing in improving the quality of antimalarials by 10% would result in annual savings of $598 million, United States dollars in Nigeria, 79 million in two regions of the Democratic Republic of Congo, and 14 million in Uganda, and 8.3 million in Zambia. Among the different investments that governments could make toward malaria burden reduction, ensuring the quality of all antimalarials was actually found to be the most impact, impactful course in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, and Zambia in our simulation. While in Nigeria, it was second to preventing medicine stockouts. In addition, the negative impact of antimalarial anti resistance, a potential consequence of recurrent use of poor quality medicines, could have a substantial negative impact potentially costing countries nearly 10 million in Zambia to 839 million in Nigeria. This shows that improving medicine quality is impactful and can contribute to preventing additional costs from the potential development of antimicrobial resistance. So to sum, ensuring the quality of essential medicines is critical to reaching universal health coverage goals. We need both data-driven and risk-based regulatory approaches to tackle substandard and falsified medicines. First, it's important to use data from national quality laboratories to issue recalls and alerts for poor quality medicines. And second, we should promote information sharing between countries' medicine regulatory authorities as part of regulatory harmonization and reliance initiatives. We should also use data on bioequivalence to inform registration and procurement of cheaper drug generic medicines. Moreover, it's essential to focus regulatory and quality assurance resources on medicines that pose the greatest risk of being poor quality and ensuring the integrity of the supply chain. We also need research and risk analysis of country-specific contexts to inform which medicines, geographic areas, and supply chains to target through risk-based regulatory approaches. So together, we can fight substandard falsified medicines in the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Here are the resources used in this presentation. Um, feel, please feel free to email me for these resources uh, or any questions you may have. And thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about this important global problem of substandard and falsified medicines. Sachi, thank you very much for this insightful presentation. And I think the perspective of health economics is extremely important. It was very impressive how you showed that just a certain improvement in the quality of antimalarials should result in millions and millions of savings for many countries. And when we really try to convince political decision makers, I think this is something which will really be listened to and which is very important in decision making in all countries in the world, and especially also in the low and middle income countries. Thank you for this presentation. And I would like to lead over to our last speaker, who is Stanislas Barrow. And he is a global head of anti-counterfeiting in the Novartis pharmaceutical company. When we had already set up the program of our workshop, just in the last days, Stanislas contacted us and informed that, that over about the last 12 months, um, he and colleagues at Novartis, together with World Health Organization, had actually communicated with a panel of um, important stakeholders worldwide to address the question of how we can ensure that patients in Africa have access to safe, effective, and quality-assured medicines. And he asked us for the opportunity to possibly give just the essence of the outcome of this 
communication with stakeholders worldwide. And obviously, this is very much at the center of what we are discussing in this workshop. So we are very happy um, to have you here. And I will start your presentation from my computer. So we are looking forward to your presentation on the scourge of falsified medicines in Africa. I hand over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Uh, indeed, it's going to be a very brief presentation and uh, we, we truly appreciate the opportunity. It's, um, as Professor Heide uh, actually exposed to you, um, it's to present a research paper that was initially commissioned by the Geneva, Geneva Health Forum um, that we were uh, hopeful to present actually during the uh, edition taking place next month. But, uh, you know, due to the context, a number of things have um, had to be rescheduled, uh, including this presentation. Um, so um, we're delighted to have this opportunity of this particular workshop focusing on falsified medicines in Africa uh, to give you a high level of a view of the content of this research uh, paper. Um, so first of all, I'd like to emphasize um, that it is truly um, a collaborative work um, that, that took place here for uh, basically over a year. Um, I have the privilege to present it to you, but it was done under the direction of uh, Hulin Cho from WHO, uh, Arnaud Pourdon from Meditect, and Varda Duerle and myself from, from Novartis, but also and foremost uh, from uh, 12 experts in the field. Um, they come from a public and private sector. They are academics or they work for private uh, companies. Uh, so um, we had a vast panel actually of 12 experts, but all had expertise in medicines quality on access uh, in the African region particularly and contributed to this research paper which basically aims at promoting concrete ways uh, for African patients to access safe, effective and quality assured medicines and I think we've just discussed about this for the last uh, over an hour now. Um, so for nearly a year, uh, the panel explored uh, critical areas where they believe actually a change is not only needed, but also possible to finally challenge the statu quo. On the statu quo, we, we believe, and I think there is consensus even here today, uh, it's a widespread of falsified medicines at the expense of African patient safety. So these critical areas we identified cover policies, capacity building with national authorities, raising public awareness, leveraging digital technologies and open innovation, and finally fostering collective action through public-private partnership. So each of them has been individually scrutinized in the paper to understand the root cause in order to propose a realistic and effective improvement. So for each critical area, um, we have offered concrete, pragmatic, hopefully impactful recommendation, uh, each supported by concrete proposal. Or maybe, thank you very much, Professor, um, for highlighting these uh, 10 recommendations. So in the essence of time today, um, I won't have uh, the time to basically drill into each recommendation. I will limit myself to just mentioning them uh, and I will have to refer to you to the actual uh, final version of the research paper uh, to get into the actual proposal for each recommendation. But please allow me just to, to, to read them so that you get the essence uh, of the paper and I'll just briefly conclude with the next steps for, for this paper as well. So number one is basically promoting international treaty on harmonized legal uh, legal framework, such as the Medicrime Convention. And I think Karim uh, clearly referred to the Medicrime Convention during his presentation. Um, we also uh, put forward the UNODC guidelines to good legislative practice, which we believe is a very important tool that we should leverage on as well. The idea is once again to strengthen national legislation and governance and reinforce criminal sanctions and penalties against uh, criminal organizations on their individuals. Then it's about organizing annual high level events with policymakers and stakeholders to incre increase political awareness and engagement and promote success stories for the region as well. We believe that it's absolutely critical also to have this political engagement, uh, otherwise we're unlikely to be successful on this policy environment uh, as well. Capacity building. 
We want to develop and strengthen national reporting system of falsified medicines linked with global network. So like the WHO escalation system. So, you know, they receive all the, the escalations as well. Uh, that's part of an annual report. And we believe it's important to foster this cross collaboration and coordinated approach to detect and identify falsified medicines. And I've just seen a question about this very point actually. So thank you for the question. I look forward to uh, engaging on this uh, after in the Q&A. Number four is enhancing intelligence sharing and risk analysis to empower law enforcement activities. Um, that's very much part of the work we do day in, day out, and Novartis with, with my team. Intelligence sharing and risk analysis is absolutely critical to be effective on this. Public awareness coordination of advocacy efforts on efforts on raising public awareness at regional and national level, particularly in high risk countries through networks of healthcare professionals, consumer patient groups, research in institutions, nonprofit organizations, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry and civil societies. It seems to be a given, there is still a lot more to be done on that front as well. So uh, likewise, there is no sh nothing revolutionary with this one. Yet again, there is a lot more work to be done. And I think again, Karim and Fasai in the Fight the Fakes campaign, but I think at a local level, we could go a, a lot deeper on this. Leveraging digital technologies, we want to foster robust implementation of serialization in the region. We believe it's critical. Leveraging affordable and user-friendly digital technologies and open source innovation. We talked about the mini lab. Um, there are also things we could do and explore in relation to blockchain, artificial intelligence, track and trace. Uh, certainly, we want to increase data and technology liter literacy amongst population, notably innovators healthcare workers and patients. Uh, there is a lot of innovation at the local level. We want to foster and leverage on this. Then promoting organizations, rewarding these young innovators, as I just mentioned, because I think there is a lot in that front we are not necessarily tapping into as we should. And finally, to conclude, collective action, absolutely critical, public and private meeting, really. Uh, establishing a regional public and private partnership with Robert Governance, focusing on operations as well. We're very committed to that, and we believe that could be a very important step as well. So what are the next steps for this research paper? And I will conclude on this. Uh, is going to be published by the Health Policy and Planning, which is a scientific journal by the uh, from Oxford Academic. The timeline is likely to be by the end of December, early January. January, we're waiting for the final confirmation on the publication date. So unfortunately, I can't share it with you today. But please stay tuned. And again, we'll be more than happy to clarify this to you if you want to reach out. Uh, uh, to, to us uh, for, for these details as well. We also intend through IFPMA, uh, the Geneva Health Forum, you as well, to also engage with key stakeholders to basically discuss these recommendations, discuss the actual proposals under each uh, recommendation and see which are the ones which are the most realistic and interesting to implement at a local level and really engage into concrete discussions on actual next steps with local regional and international stakeholders who have a, an interest and an agenda in relation to Africa as well. So we look forward to, to this. We look forward to your questions and suggestions. And with this, Professor Heidi, I'll uh, give the floor back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stanislas. This was very nice. And thank you for this effort in bringing together different stakeholders. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our round of speakers, which put in um, the very different angles of looking at the problem of substandard and falsified medicines. And we would like now go to the question and answer sessions, um, referring both to the questions which have already been raised by the audience. And again, whoever is um, listening to us from all over the world, feel free to type in additional questions. Um, I have briefly to mention that um, Professor Moji Adeyeye had uh, sent me a message that she was called to the National Assembly of Nigeria for an urgent meeting. Some of you may have seen her in her car actually going there. She tried to stay with us as much as possible that she may not be available for our discussion in this moment.
Um, I would like to go to one of the first questions um, and try maybe, oops, I can, this should be the one. Um, there is a question by Andrew Farlo about how does the Minilab keep up with COVID-19? Are there any particular compounds that might challenge the technology like monoclonal antibodies, new antivirals, etc. And maybe I ask Karim whether he would like to comment on it or I also get, could add a comment from my side later on if you want. Okay. <laughs> I think you are better than me in answering the question, but definitely for the new compound, maybe we don't have the reagent available in the suitcase uh, to detect any falsified product. But you know, this, this is a, we can actually identify uh, one uh, the top 100 uh, 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 falsified uh, APIs. But for the rest, uh, I mean, uh, if there is a new threat uh, appearing, uh, I'm sure that uh, technically we will be able to add the uh, right reagent and, uh, and compound into the suitcase. But I'm sure that Professor Hyde is, uh, is better than me in answering the question. <laughs> I think you already made the point that um, I think currently Minilab is able to identify about 100 of the most important um, active pharmaceutical ingredients worldwide. Um, and of course, it's um, augmented every year, new compounds are being taken in. In principle, it would be perfectly possible to identify compounds like Remdesivir, but monoclonal antibodies would be out of the range of this technique. Um, because they are not really suitable for thin layer chromatography. Okay, um, I'll just ask Eva Gürbken, uh, did any of the question catch your interest in this moment? Please unmute your microphone, otherwise I'll just go briefly through the list and select another one. Not sure if a group can is listening to me in this moment. Yes, um, I am listening to you. <laughs> I will send the um, question of Thomas Bisimana in the chat so everyone can see it. Okay. And this is addressed to Dr. Vedaste and Professor Kayumba. Can you please read out the question because I'm not sure that everyone can see it. Okay, I need to know the impact of COVID-19 outbreak on the quality of essential medicines in Rwanda. How do you link the quality issues identified during March and October 2020 to COVID-19 pandemic? Can you kindly share a picture of the problem before the COVID-19 outbreak? So it's a comparison between March, October. Okay, Claver, would you be willing or your co colleague Vedaste to answer to this question? Uh, thank you very much for the interesting question. It's raining in Kigali. I hope uh, everybody will be able to hear us. Um, yeah, um, as mentioned by one of um, the presenters, the, the governance with uh, the countries with uh, uh, highly regulated governance are at lower risk of um, having substandard and specified medicine. And um, that's how the Rwandan system is. The pharmaceutical sector is really highly regulated. There is no these uh, street markets and uh, pharmaceutical outlets and wholesalers have to meet a lot of requirements to be given permission to open. And therefore, uh, with such regulation, we, were, we are really facing this uh, sporadic, you know, uh, substandard medicine, but falsified is, um, is really rare to find falsified medicines in Rwanda. And also, this health, universal health coverage is having a very big impact because uh, most of uh, up to 85% of Rwandan people are health insured. And therefore, 
most probably the market is not interesting for counterfeiters because of uh, such a system in place. That's how I can, uh, I can answer the question. Sorry for the, the noise, it's raining in Kigali. Okay, thank you very much um, for this answer. I get another question um, to Richard Natsi. The question is how many samples are actually being tested per year within the uh, ecumenical pharmaceutical net network with the mini lab? Thank you. Uh, actually, with the mini lab, we are able to test around 1,500 samples. The minimum numbers or, or the, the minimum tests conducted by each member turn around 50 to, one, to 150 uh, samples. So last year, from June last year to June this year, we have conducted around 1,500 samples. And we would like to really to increase the number. Uh, one of the challenges we, we said we are facing is the, uh, to have the full staff dedicates uh, people in, in, in our member organizations. And I think this will be really important to have a dedicated staff so that we can test more and yeah, and raise awareness and keep the population away from this street of uh, substandard product. Thank you. Thank you. And I see one question coming from Nigeria, from Vivian Iqueazu, and I apologize if I do not pronounce your name correctly. Um, in Nigeria, we face a substantial challenge with poor quality maternal medicines, for example, oxytocin. Um, and con this contributes to preventable deaths of thousands of women annually from postpartum hemorrhage. Have such studies been looked in other countries? Maybe if you allow, I'll just answer this question myself because we've just been um, looking into oxytocin quality actually in Malawi and Rwanda. And um, I also had a close look at the uh, international literature. So yes, um, there is fortunately quite an interest in oxytocin quality. Oxytocin, as you know, is a peptide. It's very unstable. And when it's not properly stored, it can quickly degrade. And yes, this is a major factor contributing to um, mortality from postpartum hemorrhage. And I think it's an, an area which deserves interest to look at quality. And fortunately, it does get those interests. So that's, I think here is an area where I think we already have quite some action going, going on to address this problem and especially to source oxytocin from important, from, from good quality sources. Okay, I um, was just had seen another question which I wanted to forward to you. Let me just scroll to that. And also, Eva, if you have a question ready in this moment. Yes, uh, I have one yep. from mm -hmm. Malawi. And the mm -hmm. question, I think, is best directed to Richard because it is about the mini lab network. How do you select facilities that should be members in the mini lab network? And there is, um, for example, in Malawi, all Christian hospitals are under one body. Don't you think making this one body, CHAM, a member of Minilab, can be more effective, effective than having individual hospitals as members? Yes, I think we don't have any uh, plan or criteria to select who can be can get a mini lab. It depends on the availability of funds and that most of the mini lab which are used in the uh, EPN net, mini lab network are donations from uh, DFAM. So the member who need, who show they need to use the mini lab, they request and then we, uh, we share the needs and they can be supported. And what we would like really is to have the mini lab at the 
drug supply organization level so that they can uh, monitor the, the activities in the region or the country. Then having it in the hospital level, which sometimes is not able to go beyond the hospital area. So uh, if any member of EPN organization, Church of Association, would like to have it at the central level, we are able to, yeah, to, to uh, share the need with our partners. And if we have one which can be given, we can, we can give. But also, you know, it needs also training. I've seen one question which was raised on, on the training on the cap capacity to use the mini lab. Usually when we uh, donate the mini lab, we also support the training. We use other mini lab members from different countries to share the uh, knowledge and to train the new users of the mini lab. But also the challenge we have of staff in different countries. This is really a, a challenge and need more support to train uh, uh, people who are able to use the mini lab, but also who are able to conduct or the, uh, the other uh, required uh, check for the, uh, to, to detect the substandard products, like a visual inspection, but all, also all the management of drug in the hospital level. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Richard. Um, I see another question um, about possibilities to detect falsified COVID-19 vaccines. Are there rapid screening tools available to detect falsified or substantive medicines? Or there's mentioning of a GPS software, which Pfizer is developing to track the distribution of their vaccines. Maybe our industry representatives, Karim and possibly Stanislas, would, would you like to comment on that? And maybe there would be even some issues which should or others should not be discussed in public and you, you will make a wise decision. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, look, I'm, I'm happy. I'll try to, to answer and obviously carrying, please. Um, the, yes, I mean, there are a number of uh, technologies being explored across the industry. So maybe I can highlight a couple of things we, we, we're looking into uh, at Novartis, but it's not necessarily from a vaccine perspective, but that would be definitely applicable. Um, it is true at the moment, first of all, the, um, the pharmaceutical companies who are in uh, the process of developing van vaccines and hopefully get authorization to, to put them on the market. Um, are uh, discussing uh, extensively how to protect vaccines which will uh, be exposed to an unprecedented level of risk. And we have seen that already for potential treatments, like you know, at the time we discussed hydroxychloroquine, uh, azithromycin, and a number of other options as well. Uh, and we've seen that on the market, and I think some of our speakers already explained the level of risk and what happened in this market. So we know for vaccines, it's gonna be an extremely complex situation for from a risk perspective. So there are things uh, that were um, put forward by the, the person who posted the, that, uh, sorry, there was no name. Um, so um, uh, there was basically, you know, uh, GPS tracking devices for a number of shipments. You, you can't really do that necessarily at a product level, but at least at a shipment level. Uh, you can have overt and covered security features on packaging, on, on vials or blisters as well. Uh, I could attest to the fact that we have uh, these security features in our product as well. That's good. But what is really helpful and what we're discussing here is also ways to basically test the compound. Um, so we talked about the mini lab as well. Maybe I just wanted to highlight something we're actually testing and exploring at the moment are uh, scanners, which are uh, mobile enabled. So you have an app, you have a scanner, it's vibrational spectroscopy. And again, you can do the testing of a tablet. We're exploring also liquids at the moment uh, within seconds on the test could be through your app as well. But again, it's still pilot mode as well. It's very promising so far. So uh, it's really something we would like to see progressing toward uh, global scale rollout. But again, the, the question is being ready for vaccines on COVID-19. And I think it's a bit of a race right now uh, for all of us 
trying to determine what could work, what could be effective, timely in local remote places to make sure we protect patients. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Let's be honest, there's no such a thing as I know. So we still go back to timely reporting of these incidents, you know, um, precautionary measures because uh, technology is helpful, but will it be ready by the time we launch the vaccines? I'm, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm not aware of such a thing right now. So um, yeah, just a word of caution. Thank you, Stanislas. I think I will pick one last question and then we go to the round of final statements. I see a question to Sachiko Ozaba, which reads, you showed high prevalence of substandard falsified medicines in antimalarials and antimicrobials. What do we know about the prevalence of substandard and falsified medicines or falsified products among vaccines? That's a, maybe a complicated question. I'm not sure. Yeah. So, data. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, the systematic review that we looked at did not test as many vaccines um, as they would test tablets and capsules. Um, the technology to test these uh, liquid forms haven't been as prevalent in the past. And I think they're coming as, as uh, these speakers have mentioned here. And I think it's gonna be more and more important as we think about this COVID-19 vaccine to come um, we already know that there are reports of uh, vaccines out there that, that say that they're efficacious and safe when they haven't actually been tested and approved. Um, we need to be very careful with, uh, the, uh, with making sure that the vaccines that, that are actually approved are um, not substandard and falsified, that they are actually uh, found to be safe and efficacious and that they're distributed correctly um, and to, you know, safely to the patients. Um, this is really important, not just for COVID-19, but also for regular routine immunizations uh, because it affects people's trust in vaccines and in medicines overall. So it's really important to take a look at that whole picture and make sure that we're you know, delivering medicines and vaccines that are meant to be efficacious and safe in a, in a way that are actually um, effective and safe. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, we are coming to the close to our session. Um, I mean, we were talking about problems of medicine quality in the times of COVID-19 crisis. And I would like just to mention one um, publication which is coming out every month. And it's the Medical Product Quality Report COVID-19 Issues. So if you're interested in recent developments of medical quality products, in the time of the COVID-19 crisis. Here you can get a monthly update and it's actually produced by Paul Newton and his co-workers at Oxford University. If you just Google medical quality product, medical product quality report COVID-19, it is easy to find on the internet. I would like to invite all of our panelists to give just a brief two sentence take home message what from your experience and from what you heard in our um, discussion today, what you would like our audience to take home from this discussion for now, for the future. And I would first like to invite Richard Nezi to give a just very brief 30 second statement. Thank you, Prof. I would like to say that in Africa, we need uh, solutions which uh, meet our, our, our uh, challenges. And one of these solutions still uh, is the, the, the mini lab, the mini lab. I think the mini lab would really help our hospitals and especially uh, the one which are located in the area, uh, rural areas to be uh, a way of this Uganda medicine. If our members would have much uh, capabilities to test, and if more mini labs are spread in Africa, they can really save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Richard. Next person I would like to call upon is Klavier Kayumbe and his colleague Vedaste. A brief final statement from your side. Please unmute your microphone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the last uh, take-home message from, um, from myself 
would be um, really we should reinforce uh, this framework for criminalizing a counterfeiting uh, of medicines in uh, our respective countries and uh, eventually um, reinforce uh, the uh, framework of data sharing. So we stop working really in the silos. Whoever is discovering a substandard and falsified medicine make an alert because it helps other countries not to purchase and continue selling the same products. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very important point about sharing the information. Karim Bendao, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. I think the, my message is a very simple one. Uh, falsified medicines are clearly linked to the organized crime. Therefore, we cannot leave those people and those organizations killing our population uh, in a such a way in food impunity. Strong coordination and working hand in hand is absolutely a necessity. Thank you very much, Karim. Clavia, can you mute your microphone, please? Um, and now I would like to ask Sachiko Ozawa for a brief final statement. Thank you, Dr. Heide. Um, so assuring medicine quality both contributes both to assuring that medicines are efficacious in uh, delaying the development of antimicrobial resistance and you could also scale the implementation of universal health coverage by ensuring medicine quality. And people really have the right to get medicines that work as intended, both during the pandemic and beyond. And we've shown here the, not just the health impact, but the economic impact that substandard and falsified medicines have. Thank you very much. Stanislas Barrow. You are the last one in our round to give a final statement. Sure. Um, as I said, there were 10 recommendations. So please allow me again to repeat two of them, which I believe are critical for us to have a positive impact against falsified medicines and protect patients. First of all, timely reporting of incidents of falsified medicines. We need to be quick on these things. On timely reporting to local health authorities, their competence, WHO as well is critical on that will come to us, the private sector for support. That's number one. Number two, we need to do everything we can to foster uh, collective action, public-private partnership in the areas of intelligence, capacity building, regulatory, many other areas. Success will come from this public-private partnership and we need to encourage it and we need to be positive forces on, on that front. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stanislas. And maybe I take the liberty to also make a statement from my side. Thinking about COVID-19 vaccines, uh, which hopefully we will have next year, possibly they will be the most desperately sought medicine in the history of mankind. Everybody is desperately wanting an effective COVID-19 vaccine. And so they may pose a tremendously huge challenge of also counterfeit medicines entering the market. Let's work together to be prepared for that, to prevent as good as we can the entry of falsified COVID-19 vaccines into the supply chains also in low and middle income countries um, to detect those which have ended and to respond on in a collaboration of all stakeholders to this problem, which we can surely expect. And also with my academic group, I would be happy to contribute to such efforts. Let's join forces to be prepared for this problem. I would like to thank all our speakers uh, for their excellent presentation and insightful contributions to our discussion. And of course, I thank the organizers of the World Health Summit to give us the forum to actually bring forward this workshop to the international attention. Um, and again, our hosts, the um, Association of the Research-Based Pharmaceutical Industries and the German um, Ministry of um, economy and energy. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. I will now ask you to just close your screens and leave the meeting and thanks and let's work together in future. Thank you very much. <laughs>